<clears throat> Hello, and welcome to Wands and Fronds, the weekly podcast where we cover magic, herbalism, and more. I'm Nick. And I'm Shannon. And we are your co-hosts. So today, we're diving deep into the sea to have a conversation about mermaids. And I'm going to tell you all about the queen of the ocean, the goddess of the sea, Poseidon's bottom bitch, Amphitrite. So, love it. Love it, it. It's and it's and that one, you know, that one's kind of a wild ride. So <laughs> well, since we're underwater already, I'm gonna be talking to y'all about Irish moss, which uh plot twist is also used in brewing beer, like really commonly. So wow. Okay, I so know. I'm actually I'm excited about this. I love beer. Um, it's a good thing. It's it's a good thing. So before we actually get started, though, our new question of the week is, when did you feel most magical in the last week? So to you, Shannon. Yeah. Uh, yesterday. So yesterday, I, first of all, like was just feeling my witchy self. I spent a lot of time in the morning, like gardening and like being with my plants, which is always so nice. But then I was like, I'm going to take a bath, but like a witchy bath. You know, there's a difference. There's a difference for me between relaxation bath and like, we're going to do some magic bath. And I put on this like meditation music playlist and wow, uh, my meditation visions were like crazy intense. I'm fairly certain for the first time, like I left this plane. Like I felt like I was in a different astral plane for part of it. Like and, you like you fully leaned into your Pisces moon and just floated out of your body. Yeah, it was crazy. I have like four pages of notes because when I like finally was out of it, I was like, I have to write all of this down because I'm not going to remember it. And it's been like some of the stuff I was getting was very in line with what I've been hearing from my tarot deck as well. But it was just like, it was crazy. I was not on this planet for a while. So... Very magical. <laughs> very, very magical. Um, I would say mine for this week was actually last night. Um, and so I think, you know, I do talk about this a little bit before, but lately I've been working a lot of uh, night shifts. So, you know, we'll we'll get out between 10 and 11 at some time and then go close down a bar. And then yeah. after that's afterwards is when I get dropped dropped off home you know, but it's like that hour between like two and three in the morning is um, just so, so, so quiet. And we have these really old oak trees here in my apartment complex, which are like just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous old like post oaks even. Um, and I like, I know this is going to sound like so like show offy, but there's a lot of owls where I live, like little Eastern, they're like kind of small too, but they're like little Eastern barn owls, but they still have like the loud hooting. Um, yeah, they're and it, very it actually, cute. And it actually, did, I mean, and yeah, I actually saw one uh, in your apartment complex uh, where you lived here in Austin too. Like, so, I mean, they're common enough that you see them regularly or hear them if you're listening. Um, but it's still not any less magical when you actually come across just an owl chilling. Yeah. I mean, especially after we were talking about like Minerva yeah. and, you know, I think that that's very much on brand yeah, for the it's deities like, we've been talking about. It's like about. Minerva, Athena, like we're really um, kind of going after all the owl bitches and then there's yeah. just an owl in my little tree that I like uh but also it was just so quiet and like really yeah. any moment that my brain is just like oh this is nice things are okay is pretty magical uh yeah. I would say especially now with everything yeah, going especially on now with everything going on so I love that, that journey for you. I, I I did too. I did too. And I love the cute little owls. Um always I, I, I think it's um it's almost like confirmation bias where it's like I'm always kind of looking out for them. So maybe I see a lot more than other people do, just because I'm like, I I know what I'm looking for too. I'm like, I know where in the tree they would hang out, like what they sound like when they fly. Cause you can kind of hear like when they're flying, but 
past the patio like they have like a special rustling in their leaves or no their yeah. leaves their feathers oh my god um which are just like leaves on birds yeah bird leaves bird leaves aka uh, feathers <laughs> aka feathers well on that note let's talk about scales for a minute yeah let's do it because you know what my least favorite thing about getting fucking fish is descaling fish Descaling yeah, de salmon is so fucking annoying. Descaling fish. Um, but no, we're so this week we're talking about probably the top uh top requested magical creature coverage uh that we have yet to do. It's mermaids. It's mermaids. It's, it's, it's kind of it's um it's mermaid week even. It's uh, also my like hair goals. I'm like trying to grow my hair out. I was literally just talking to Eric this morning. I was like, I just want mermaid hair. Like long. I put my sea salt spray in it today. I was just like, yes, mermaids come through. Mermaids come through. So, but we're talking about mermaids, and actually at the top, I want to talk about one of my favorite recent sort of pop culture references of mermaids is um so the user ghost honey uh whose i think real name is tyler has this like tiktok out where it's like do you want to go in the pool and play mermaids and then is playing both characters but then um sort of gets out like a notebook about all of the very intricate backstories and powers of the mermaids. And I'm like, I actually, I, that was probably like me as a kid though. Oh you yeah. Know? We had an above ground pool and me and my sister played mermaids all the time. Yeah. Also at, there like, was nothing more fun than like putting your legs together and trying to and, swim. And trying to swim like a mermaid. Yeah, of course. Which, which is part of it. Um, so. Yeah, we're talking about mermaids. And so for those of you who maybe don't know, is that, I mean, are there people who don't know what mermaids are? But um, so basically a mermaid is a fish on the bottom. So like no legs, just like a big giant fish's tail, but uh, sort of the upper body of a person. Um, and then if it's a, if it's a, if it's a mermaid, a lot of times, you know, seashell bikini or like, starfish pasty um, it's one or the other you gotta cover of, the nips disney is gotta, not x-rated you gotta cover the nips um but you know but yeah so we're talking fish on the bottom man on top um which i actually i was i kind of had this at the at the end but i'm gonna move it to the top just because we're describing what a mermaid is and i do think it's kind of ridiculous um just like the physics of that. Um, so so in um in Yorkshire, in England, they have Grindylows, which uh also feature as part of the Harry Potter series, where they're kind of like the pets of the Murray people. Yeah. Um they're almost like they're kind of almost like frogfish like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got like long fingers, like long mm -hmm. kind of amphibian fingers, and they're like green and like live in bogs in Harry Potter. At in least. Harry Potter, and it was well, so in in the original myth though. So they're kind of more like leprechauns or gnomes or other sort of magical creatures like that. In that they they just have like a fully human shape that's sort of adapted to water, um, and also like the name Grindylo is um, derived roughly from Grindel, like, because Grindel lived at the bottom of the swamp, you know, so it's sort of like a description of where they live, in the Grindylows, um, so, but there, but I think the mer, the, the mermaid is kind of ridiculous, like, you would either have, like, like, Grindylows, or, you know, like, the cartoons of the sea monkeys? Yes. Or you would have, like, a sentient fish, I think, would also make a lot more sense. You know, like, just, like, a really smart dolphin, even. Yeah. I've always... My thing is, like, because I know mermaid sex is such a thing, right? Like, when oh, we were yeah. talking we're about get this... Into it. I was talking about the lighthouse. Uh, uh -huh. With the, like, did Robert Pattinson fuck a mermaid? Anyway, I've, I'm always just, like... I know that's such a thing, but then, like, you start, you take it one step further and try to think about, like, where do you put the dick? Oh, yeah. Well, because sort of the the idea, though, being that f 
fish, the way that fish breed is that one of the fish lays eggs in the in the water or somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's different ways to do it, but but it's, it happens outside of the body. It happens yeah. Out, like the sperm are just swimming through open water to eggs that are also just floating yeah. in open water. It's not a penetration situation. It's not a penetration situation. Uh, and so both male and female fish have like fully internal genitalia. Yeah. Um, and like, can you imagine all of the like infections you would get if they didn't? Like. Right, 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 right. Um, but all of that to say, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a weird idea. It's a weird idea sort of by all biologically like bottom half is a fish top half is a person um and I've, I've always kind of been like hmm but i but there's a lot of perverts out there y'all so um mermaid sex we're gonna we're gonna talk we're gonna talk about it we, we're absolutely gonna talk about it but we for for this episode obviously we do have to go way back in time approximately 5000 years ago get your drinks ready you know what i'm going to say we're going to mesopotamia um and we have to talk about awanas the first merman roughly 3000 bc we're talking here so you guys basically we know that civilization developed in the fertile crescent at least as far as we know. And their creation myth involves this creator god, Awanus, Awanus. Um, and he's primarily depicted as being half man, half fish, because the original Mesopotamians um, were, were said to come from the sea. So, you know, it's like the, in their creation myth, the first people come from the sea, and Awanus is like the creator god of them, the first people, and he gives them culture too. So he also teaches them about architecture and farming and art and literature and writing and you know all these great things that are really the cornerstones of a settled civilization uh, like basically he taught them how to make houses uh, whereas before they were not living in houses and actually th these kinds of myths of having um culture kind of come from the sea a lot of historians think it's kind of tied in with with also maybe what would be called the biblical flood and yeah towards the end of the last mini ice age the ice caps did melt a considerable amount um, and sea levels did rise a considerable amount. So you do have Doggerland, which would have been the land between England and, and sort of Belgium and Amsterdam, uh, what we would call the English Channel. There's, there's evidence of settled communities there. Uh, presumably a lot of these myths are like civilized people coming from a coastal deluge because actually the uh, the Persian Gulf which is you know sort of where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers flow into the Persian Gulf um, if you're not familiar with the geography of that part of the world and was considerably more land there because it's quite shallow so when the sea level had gone up it filled in this Persian Gulf but the idea sort of being that there might have been a more civilized people that lived on the coast and then had to flee because of rising. But I mean, this, this did happen slowly over time, but they also can't really identify the other. There's like two base languages for what um, ended up being like Phoenician, right? And one of them is an Aramaic language. So it's in the same language family as Arabic and Hebrew and the other base language they don't really identify and so maybe that was like the language of the people who had lived closer to the coast um you know there's also Atlantis like these much more cultured people kind of interacting with these sort of hunter-gatherer people um and kind of creating this like fusion society even but kind of being seen as like 
these great culture bringers. And so the story that the original story was that they came from the sea, which makes sense because they did come from the sea, um, kind of. Or they would they would even say, well, where we used to live is underwater, which also, you know, could be translated as we come from the sea. Uh, it's like because as the toady said, we come from the water. We come from the water. We all do. But, and we do, but uh, but these people might actually have come from the sea. And I think it's interesting that those what would have been very, very real stories at the time do get mythologized and then you end up with a fish man. But that fish man, that 5,000 year old fish god even, fish man god, Oanus, uh, was the first mer person in recorded history. Um, and thank God for cuneiform tablets because that's why we know Again, fuck you, Druids, for not writing any of your shit down. All you had to do is fucking write it down. All you had to do was write it down. Uh, but we, but the Phoenicians wrote everything down in easy to preserve for thousands of years, clay tablets, uh, cuneiform tablets. And thank you so much, because that's how we know who the first mermaid was. Mad and props, I, mer, mer, Phoenicians. Merman, because this is a big win for the men's rights movement. Um, <laughs> Um, finding out that the first mer person was a man. Um, but it's like, is that toxic masculinity? Probably. I feel like it is. I feel like it is. <laughs> um, but okay. So about 800 years later, we're still in the area. We're talking about Northern, specifically Assyria, which also this goddess is sometimes associated with Venus as well, but um, it's a Stargadus. A Stargadus. Mm. Isn't that quite a mouthful? Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking like roughly 2200 BC, and she's taken on a lover who is a, a young hero, a Hercules type, unnamed though, okay? And she's sort of this multifaceted goddess um, sort of the protector of northern Assyria, also responsible for sort of love and beauty and culture. Like, we're, we're getting a very big Venus vibes. Yeah. And very much like this creator goddess, right? But she's taken on this lover and um, given birth to a daughter who would later become the queen of Assyria in a completely separate story that we're not talking about because we're, we're only interested in the mermaid part of the story. Because Astargadus was the first mermaid. So her lover dies tragically. Um, and so she kind of abandons her baby, which is who later becomes a queen. So it's not like she had really a bad life, but Astargadus, her goddess mother, abandons her. To yeah, be that's raised, not to cool. be to be raised by humans. Um, and that's, you know, lots of goddesses. You know, it's like Hera chucking her baby Vulcan off Mount Olympus. You know, you just yeet a baby and move on with your life. Um, just yeet that baby. Yeet that baby. So she basically is going back to where they had met or, you know, like where, where he was from. And it's sort of like where the river meets the sea. And she decides she's just going to like walk out into the water and end it all because she can't live she can't live without her man and which is so just emo as fuck like yeah because i imagine like it's not like you're like running out into the water you're just like walking slowly like somebody stop me i'm just i'm so distraught i'm just gonna walk out into the sea and until the waves cover my head and Oh, God, like, so, so, so fucking emo. Yeah, um, it's like, come on, like, eh, it's just a dude. Right, but so because she's a goddess, though, instead of dying, she's transformed into a mermaid. And actually, that's the first mermaid, the first mermaid that's a, it's a lady mermaid. Um, so originally we had one, one dude mermaid, one, one merman. Uh, but now, now there's a mermaid. Um, and then 
you, you know, like I said, sort of they consider Venus a proxy goddess of um, a star goddess. And also Amphitrite is also considered a proxy goddess of the star goddess because of this. Now she's also the goddess of the sea, which the people in northern Assyria were heavily involved in, you know, the fruits of the ocean and, and the river. And, um, you know, it makes sense that that same type of worship would carry over to Greece, which is, you know, uh, as well as being a, a, a country, it is also a series of islands even. So um, it makes sense. It makes sense that they were also like picking up on other nautical deities from the region. Yeah, it's like cultural exchange is common when you're that close. Um, and so then, you know, kind of moving to Greece even, Triton, who we're, we're going to talk about Triton's family tree just a little bit more on, later on when we're talking about uh, Amphitrite, but Triton, who is born to Amphitrite and Poseidon, is also a, a merman um, and sort of makes sense being born to the queen of the sea nymphs and the god of the sea that kids would be kind of mermaidy, but but I guess we're kind of talking like the classical depiction of a mermaid, though. Fish on bottom, guy on top. Yeah. So that's, we all know that, that Triton is Ariel's dad. Tri Triton is Ariel's dad. And actually, the Greeks do, well, because, you know, the Greeks have this whole thing where there's nymphs and sprites in everything. It's a very animistic pantheon. So as well as the gods, there's also all of these spirits and magical creatures. And you get a bit of the lore of mermaids, how mermaids have this peaceful society under the, the water somewhere, you know, and it's like, is it the lost city of Atlantis? That's, that's speculation on my part, but I mean, they did do it in Little Mermaid, so why not, right? Um, <laughs> but no, um, so you do have the developing during the Greek mermaid times this idea that mermaids are neutral and we kind of talked about how iconic that is when we talked about the Baba Yaga yeah. about how being neutral is actually kind of cool and it, it really it's agency even like you can call up a storm and fuck up some sailors lives or you could also calm a storm, you know, it's like they have these powers of the ocean and they kind of decide, they pick and choose. And it's, you know, it's, it's very, um, very neutral. Some of them are working for evil. Some of them are working for good, which is a key difference between mermaids and sirens because sirens are always up to no good. And they only always. have, they only have bad intentions. But sirens are not fucking mermaids. And we actually have no. to, we, we have to talk about this because it's like, I don't know which version of the Odyssey you're reading, but the original sirens were like bird ladies. Bird and ladies. they were like up on the cliffs and the rocks, kind of perched like seabirds, using their beautiful voices to call the sailors in to crash on the rocks and die. Um, but they're not mermaids. Like, so yeah. I'm sorry to the world's most popular coffee chain, but that's not a siren. That is a mermaid. Yeah. And if anybody, or if you, Nick, no, I was just on my phone because I'm like, I cannot remember, but pretty recently I saw a pop culture representation of a siren that was like a bird woman. And I'm like, it is itching my brain and maybe I'll remember, but she definitely lived on an island and a guy fell in love with her, I think, and decided to like stay on the island with her and the rest mm. of the people left. But I'm like, it was like fairly recently. It wasn't Pirates of the Caribbean, was it? No. No. I don't think I've seen all the Pirates of the Caribbean, but... No, if, no, because, yeah, because there's, like, a million of them. I know, but if anyone knows what I'm talking about, 
wandsandfranzpod at gmail.com or at wandsandfranzpod on Instagram. Or I found out it is wandsandfranzpod on Facebook. So, oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, I just like, it's itching my brain. Maybe I'll remember eventually. But yeah, they're not fucking fish creatures. But yeah, sirens have nothing to do with mermaids, even. Except for the fact that they both prey on sailors. Yeah, which is like, okay, them and like every queer in the world also. Yeah. Like, lots of women on shore leave. Like, it's fine. It's Everyone fine. preys on sailors is what we're Everyone preys at. on sailors. Sailors are sort of famously hot. Yeah. They're famously hot. So much sexual tension with other men on the boat for mm -hmm. months and months at a time. Yeah. Like, come on. Who uh, hasn't preyed on a sailor? Speaking of preying on sailors, uh, we're kind of moving, you know, we're talking a little bit about ancient Greek mermaids and how they had kind of mythologized, you know, how mermaids do have this very harmonious and balanced culture and live in a utopia uh, even somewhere under the ocean and that's really what we're getting from the greeks and also keeping with the theme of um mermaids and fish on bottom guy on top and we're and uh we've mentioned before that Pose poseidon would not you know, fuck with sailors so much if there was uh, titties on the boat, basically. Yeah. And one of the most common ways to get titties on the boat was to put... A mermaid! A mermaid on uh, sort of the bow of your ship. Yeah, but a free boob and mermaid, not free boob a mermaid. shell bikini mermaid. No seashell bikinis here. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, but actually, it was one of the most common... So, like, during the Golden Age of Sailing, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of images of mermaids... There's actually a very famous painting of sort of these kids pulling the mermaid from the front of a boat out of the water. And it's kind of like the kids are like having fun and playing by the seaside. But it's also sort of like this reference to a ship. Like in order for that to have happened, there has to have been a sunken ship, like a shipwreck. Yeah. So it's sort of this playful scene of like the kids playing on the beach and like pulling this like mermaid statue out of the water. But then it's also kind of dark because that means a ship got busted up on the rock, speaking of sirens. Right. Which are famously not mermaids. Which are fucking bird people. They're bird ladies. We should we should cover sirens at some point. Yeah, because they're not fucking mermaids. So it would, yeah. be, a, it would be a different segment completely. <laughs> um, but speaking of the golden age of sailing, we have to talk about mermaids on maps so a lot of the mythology with sailors around mermaids is that they would call up storms and in you know sort of beckon you into the water kind of like a siren you know like they beckon like a beautiful mer lady would like swim up to the boat and like be all like sexy and floating and be like, in the water mm, look at my boobs look at my long <laughs> hair i'm yeah. in the water aren't I'm in you the water. horny yeah and it, sort of drown them and eat them, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, that's always part two. <laughs> but again, it, they were neutral. Like, sometimes mermaids were known to, to help sailors or, like, guide them to a, 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 a sheltered cove to get away from a storm. Like, it really depends on which mermaid you get. But they are dangerous. These are dangerous, powerful, sort of elemental ocean creatures and they can sort of do their own kind of magic even and they can fuck you up they can fuck you up so mermaids and dragons and you know if but anywhere on sort of an old 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 map where they would draw like a mermaid in the water was also kind of like a shorthand for this is like a dangerous spot or like this is a stormy part of the sea yeah and they would use this kind of art on the map to sort of symbolize different things so when you look at like a really old map of the world and you see where there's a mermaid hanging out in the water uh, it's not fun times over there it's not it's actually not fun times over there although you know um so so that's really kind of brings us to today like obviously we do have to talk uh, just a little bit about 
Hans Christian Andersen's story, The Little Mermaid, which actually is kind of what carries mermaid culture into modern times, according to oh, yeah. a lot of people who study culture, because really, like, after the Golden Age of Sailing, the stories had kind of gone by the wayside. Yeah, but I mean, you... the alternative title for this episode is Look at This Stuff, Isn't It Neat? Right. Um, but then you do have this very, very famous fairy tale, but, which is The Little Mermaid, where she loses her voice and, you know, and it's like, comes We get our the, first drag queen villain. Yes, and uh, it's great. Yeah, and then, the, of course, the Disney movie, but also the statue of the Little Mermaid in, I believe it's Copenhagen, Denmark. Yeah, I think so. Uh, is, you know, one of the most famous artistic images of a mermaid. Um, and then also sort of like the mermaids from Peter Pan, I think are funny because they actually are kind of true to what original mermaid folklore was, was that they were sort of mischievous and, but also, but in Peter Pan, they do help Peter Pan and they're friends with him because he, you know, they, he has a bargain with them. He has yeah. a bargain with them even. So they can be bargained with, they're, they're rational people on top but on bottom they're fish they're fish yeah plus there's the whole current trend of like typically middle-aged women like especially on the island where my mom lives going on like mermaid swimming trips and like getting mm. their fins and learning how to like swim like a mermaid irl which like honestly i'm like if that had existed when i was a little girl yeah absolutely would have been so, but I also feel like, because here's, here's the thing, that would be so, so, so great as a kid to get to do. Also, do you remember that movie, that Disney Channel original movie, The 13th Year? Yes. Yes. Um, what an awakening that was. Yeah. In so many ways. And I really think The 13th Year is queer culture. Mermaid culture is queer culture. But more to what you were saying... I think to put that, to put a mermaid fin on a child would maybe even somewhat be a drowning hazard is why they <laughs> don't do that. Probably. Because we do live in the age of lawsuits and um, there'd have to be a class or something. Like yeah. you couldn't, you couldn't just sell child-sized mermaid fins at Walmart. And if you did, it'd be a lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, but it my is, kid, it's a thing. My kid drowned in the pool because I left them unattended in the mermaid fins. Yeah. So. Yeah, but yeah, so there are, like, totally, like, mermaid swim instructors and stuff and, like, some vacation spots, which, you know, I'm like, it looks fun, but not necessarily something I'd want to do in a group as an adult, personally. Yeah, yeah. But... I mean, but, you know, like... Whatever, More power it, to them. whatever empowers whatever empowers you you know if you're feeling the mermaid energy by all means um, yeah you do you i'm just i'm awkward in crowds yeah. <laughs> um which is sort of famously why i'm going on vacation alone during the low season of where i'm going to so because yeah, yeah um but okay so we have to talk about you filthy fucking perverts and your obsession with i mean and sort of my own obsession with, because of your obsession with, mermaid sex. So we kind of talked about at the top that scene from The Lighthouse, which, you know, some very realistic mermaid sex. Um, but also just like, ew. Oh my God, my phone is ringing. Um, but also, ew. Like literally. They're fish. They're fish, so I can't imagine even if fish did not famously lay eggs in the water to be fertilized, I can't imagine that would smell very good, you know? But also, it's like, I think it's gross to think of, like, like a human pussy just, like, on a fish tail, just, like, just there. Yeah, none of it's working. I mean... Like, out of place? Like, I don't know, like, kind of, like, looking like, you know, like, the opening of a fleshlight, just, like... Well, there's also this, like, weird pop culture rumor, I don't know if you were privy to, 
um, where Tom Cruise was like buying fish, disappearing into the bathroom, and then coming out like without the fish looking like hot and bothered. So some people postulated that Tom Cruise might have been fucking the fish. Uh, it's a very weird like pop culture conspiracy. Please go down this rabbit hole. I, if anyone I, I was like, going to, it'd be Tom Cruise. Is is that a tenant? of Scientology that we don't know about because it's high level. Yeah, he's a god, apparently. So maybe fish fucking is like the ultimate in Scientology. Like you go you go to your like last initiation as a Scientologist and it's just a pile of fish and you have to fuck them all. Yeah. So Uh, anyway, I'm like, that's what it makes me think of. It's like, ew. But no, but but I mean, it is sort of, it does tie in with the sort of original sailors mythology of mermaids and that they can kind of seduce you. But I just, I think logistically speaking, the fact that there's so many stories about like being seduced by a mermaid or like making love to a mermaid on a beach, I'm like, gross. That's gross. That's gross to me. I'm sorry. It's not, it's not the vaginal intercourse part of it that I find gross. It's the fish uh, part of it. It's the fish part of it. Like, yeah. just just to be clear. I um, also wouldn't fuck a dolphin. I would not fuck a dolphin. When it's like all those water animals too, like even, you know, it's like all their stuff is kind of like internal, which is very, very different from how land mammals operate. Where like, you know, it's, um, there's junk. There's junk to play with even. Um <laughs> So yeah. it's like, it's like what, you know, it's like with, with like a water, with like a sea creature, there's like really, there's like nothing to look at. There's nothing to really like, you know, like why would fucking a mermaid be fun? Why is there so much mermaid porn? I don't get it. And, and, and that's kind of where we're ending it. Um, it's like the same, it's like the same as centaurs. Like you people are fucking sick for that. Um, and you need to, you need to, you need to grow up, okay? <laughs> you need to grow up. Wow. Fucking a, fucking a mermaid would not be cool. Yeah. Well, we're going to, like, kind of take a sharp left here. And I want you all to, like, get the visuals of fucking fish out of your mind. And we, picture- need a, we, need a, we need a palate cleanser. Let's do, do our asks. We do. So, you guys, um, what can you do? You can like. You can subscribe. You can, if you're really, really special you can leave a review. Yeah. Um, you can just download to, the episode. Yeah, even just like a couple of words, like this podcast is good, period. It helps, okay? It that helps. Way so, that way when someone's looking for a good podcast. <laughs> They're like, this podcast is good, says user 479. <laughs> um, yeah, you can also join our Patreon. Today we just did a really great interview with friend of the pod, beautiful jewelry maker, Shannon of Hacks and Wolf. And if you are on our Patreon, you get to check it out. And if not, you're missing out on some fun primo content. So you can find that by going to patreon.com slash wands and fronds pod. Help us keep our lights on, you guys. Can't do a podcast if I can't pay my electricity bill, okay? Yeah, help keep us in candles, y'all. Um, and yeah, so you can reach out to us, wands and fronds pod at gmail.com at Wands and Franz Pod on Instagram, Wands and Franz Pod on Facebook. We love hearing from you. We have like recently heard from a new like friend of the pod. And if you're one of those people that's been listening for a long time and you're like, oh, everyone says reach out, but they don't mean that. No, we really mean it. Like it makes, uh, makes us happy. Shannon, who we just had on our Patreon episode, Shannon the Jewelry Maker, um, was initially someone just like you maybe, who had just written in just to, you know, just to commentate on something that we had said in an episode. And then we're, we're IRL friends now. So if you want to be, if you want to be IRL friends, um, hit us up, uh, let us know. I mean, you know, it's like last week we asked what people's Thai food order was. Um, and you know, like we'll do something like that in pretty much every episode. So we even give you icebreakers. So don't be shy. Don't you shy. don't have to make it up. We're doing the work yeah. for you. So, okay, everyone, I want you to like close your eyes. Pic- picture this. You are walking along the rocky coast of Ireland. 
the tide is low and you come upon this ledge and on the rocks you can see algae and moss and then this algae and moss is all so beautiful and glowing and you take out your little scavenging scissors and you cut the moss away and you let it dry in the sun for a day and then you store it for future use and now you are a sea witch oh so my God. wait we're sea witches now That's now we're so sea witches cool. so this is how irish moss was traditionally harvested so irish moss is also known as carrageen moss jelly moss curly moss or pearl moss it's not actually a moss it's an algae but it's in the gigarten gigartanaceae family and the latin name is chondrus crispus which i just like makes me want chips so you can find it at low tide on the atlantic coasts of europe and north america and it's botanically described as cartil cartilaginous fronds what a mouthful so it does kind of look like a morbid three-dimensional snowflake and the fronds can range from like tiny two inches all the way to like monster foot-long fronds and they kind of have like bronchial vibes which we'll talk about in a bit with the doctrine of signatures but they're like thicker in the center of the frond and they kind of thin out as you get close to the margins and <clears throat> excuse me when it's fresh this sea moss is like this like deep purple brown so with all the like fronds and the bronchial kind of ends looking like it branches out and it being like deep purplish brown it's kind of got like blood vibes almost mm -hmm. but when they're dried they turn into this like really lovely shade of cream so irish moss has been used medicinally since the early 19th century and its colloquial name carrageen comes from the irish carrigan and in the 18th and 19th century, when Irish migrants were, like, leaving Ireland en masse due to the potato famine that was fucking caused by England, they brought the use of Irish moss to New England, where they, like, basically created a cottage in industry from the ground up. So nowadays, carrageenan is indeed extracted from Irish moss, as well as, like, other seed seaweeds, and it's a food additive. Um, they add it a lot of times to like low fat foods because it can make it like creamier. It gives it like a better mouthfeel when you take all the fat out of dairy products. It gets kind of gross. It's, it's, uh, it, uh, can, does it kind of make things gelatinous? Because I know that's a lot of sea things have that, mm -hmm. that quality of making things a little thicker. Yeah, yeah. And they also use it as an emulsifier in like other products, things like toothpaste and fish oil supplements to like thicken it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and Irish moss is used as a fining agent by brewers because it helps prevent chill haze. So you can have like a clear beer. There's science behind that. But literally I was on like, uh, I think it's like Midwestern, what is it? Midwestsupplies.com, which is a brewer supply thing, reading about its use in beer. But you might be thinking, carrageenan? I've heard that it's awful for you and it causes like cancer and inflammation. Shannon, what the fuck are you doing talking about this? So let's just say right up top, the research on the role that carrageenan plays in cancer development is like not unanimously agreed upon by scientists. Like some actually postulate that like the role of the gut flora and the lab rats played a role in the development of cancers in lab rats that were given carrageenan and obviously human gut flora is significantly different than that of rats and, and it's like you know it's one of those things where it's like not to play devil's advocate for you know like the the farm pharmaco chemical industries but when they're doing those lamb rat tests, it's like really, they're probably, you know, I mean, it's like in those levels that you would have to be feeding an animal something to act to kind of see what the effects are. It's like you would never actually eat a diet consisting of like half carrageenan by volume. Like, yeah. And it's, and this is also another instance where it's like an isolated chemical. Yeah. is different than a whole plant right so like talk to your healthcare team like make the best decisions for your health in concert with your physicians but like i i really 
am very wary of super fear mongering around like plants because of like one constituent in them. Like it's different than saying, don't eat belladonna, it'll kill you. But like saying that there's like this one chemical, it's like the thing with arsenic and apples that we've talked about. Right. Like the toxicity is in the dosage, but talk to your doctor. So disclaimer, disclaimer, I'm not a doctor. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Uh, please don't use it to treat or diagnose anything. Again, talk to your doctor before you start an herbal regimen. So, but you want to use Irish moss in your herbal practice. One of the most common traditional uses of this little algae is to thicken soups and jellies, which of course were like used whenever someone came down with like a respiratory illness. Like think when you get like a chest cold or bronchitis, I mean, back then tuberculosis, what do you want? Like hot soup, right? Mm, mm -hmm. And remember I said that it kind of looks like bronchioles. Well, right, right. by decocting Irish moss, you produce something that's called phycocolloid carrageenan gel, which actually can like soothe damaged lungs. And it's even potentially effective as like a long-term treatment for things like emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So it's one of those things where like the natural inclination and like the things that your body craves, especially for people in this part of the world, also included things that were helping on a deeper level than just like making you feel better and comforted. Um, and although large amounts of carrageenan are not recommended for folks with irritable bowel disease, some research has actually shown that Irish moss can protect against inflammatory damage to the GI tract. And it does that by um, protecting the stomach lining and the duodenum by neutralizing gastric acid secretion. And you can also, by eating it regularly, help uh, the microbiota in your gut develop digestive enzymes that allow your body to absorb more nutrients from the food you eat. Because it has this like really great duality, right? It's both a, co a cooling demulcent, so it's like moisturizing, kind of coating. Thinking about like slippery elm bark tea when you're sick, coating your throat. Think about that kind of like in your gut with things like this. But also if you have IBD, notoriously people with things like Crohn's and colitis have a really hard time with like nutritional deficiencies because they're actually not absorbing everything from their food. So it's, it's great that Irish moss has like this huge amount of vitamins and minerals. I think it's like, there's something like 190 minerals that we need and Irish moss has like 180 of them or something crazy. Like it has so much goodness. So, you know, again, talk to your doctor, but if you have IBD, I think it's something worth asking your physician about. And it's also able to retain up to 10 times its own weight in water, which can help with dehydration. Anyone who's ever had a bout of diarrhea knows how important hydration is. We were just dealing with a sick dog yesterday get your water in, but things like Irish moss can be really helpful for that, especially if you're under the weather. And I was really, really fascinated to learn that recent research into Irish moss and carrageenan actually show that it can be a supportive antiviral with the ability to inhibit HPV and herpes simplex virus. And in fact, carrageenan has inhibited genital HPV nearly a thousand times more than heparin sulfate, which is like, the fuck and HP, hpv can cause like all sorts of like cancers particularly in women so in addition to like this very specific use sulfated polysaccharides have been undergoing like a lot of research because specifically marine sulfated polysaccharides can prevent viruses from binding and entering host cells which is why they're really cool like antivirals so basically these little components kind of like mimic the way viruses work and they bind onto the outside of cells so the virus can't get in there and replicate because that's how viruses work, right? They infect healthy cells and then the cells replicate, the virus spreads, marine sulfated polysaccharides kind of like stop it in its tracks, which is awesome. I actually read like this really great research article on potentially using like these like marine derived polysaccharides in like antivirals against COVID even, which very cool. And marine sulfated polysaccharides exist in like all sorts of like seaweed and kelp. So anyway, 
There have also been some really cool studies on using Irish moss and sexual lubricants to help reduce the spread of like HPV and genital warts, which is super cool. Um, rather though than taking it like a supplement, the best way to consume seaweeds in general is like adding it to your diet. Um, I love a seaweed salad. Personally, it's one of my mm -hmm. favorite things. Mm -hmm. Anytime I go out for Japanese food. But of course you can like, Irish moss traditionally is added to like this pudding called blanc mange or even combined with like chocolate or cocoa to make kind of like a pudding. Mm -hmm. And of course you can add it to soups and stews. Like anything that comes from the water, like it is so, 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 so important to make sure you're sourcing it well because seaweed can act like a sponge for like pollutants, radioactive poisons. So like you don't want to just like go to Lake Granberry and pull some seaweed out and eat it. No, absolutely. Well, it's like you mentioned Lake Granberry, which is. I, okay, so since this is like the theme of the episode anyway, it's, one thing I do think is funny in Lake Granberry is that there's a lot of underwater abandoned oil wells. Yeah. In Lake Granberry. And what they do with those is they fill them up with salt water and then seal them. And actually, well, the rumor is, or the rumor is, that those are, those are leaking into Lake Granberry, making it saltier, or like salty enough that there is a species of crabs that has gotten a foothold in Lake Granberry, like tiny, tiny, tiny little saltwater crabs though. Like yep. they, live on, they live in the bottom of the lake where we come from. And, um, but also the water from the salt water from an oil well, like you do not want to be eating that. Nope. I also got an amoeba attached to my intestinal lining when I was a child from swimming in Lake Granberry. And I was very little, but I distinctly remember having to get enemas until the water ran clear, which not fun. Not fun. Uh, Man-made lakes are gross, y'all. Stay out. Um, but there are lots of great places to source like Irish moss and seaweeds that have been harvested from like clean, healthy bodies of water. You know, they actually have Irish moss at Wild Terra, which here in LA is where I go. Wild Terra does ship. So you can also get stuff shipped from them because there's been a little bit of drama with Mountain Rose herbs, like herbalist drama that we will not get into here. Um, they're still a great resource, but Wild Terra also ships and I do love them personally. Um, also, if you have any sort of thyroid issues, you need to be careful with seaweed consumption overall because seaweed contains a lot of iodine and no one should be consuming a ton of iodine anyway. Like iodine poisoning is not pretty, but iodine really has um, a lot of effects on your thyroid in particular. So if you're someone with hyper or hypothyroid, um, just be careful about how much seaweed you consume in general. Um, definitely talk to your doctor if you're on thyroid medication and some like medicines, their, their absorption might be hindered by Irish moss. But again, talk to your doctors about any like dietary restrictions, um, that might apply to you. <laughs> so on to the magic. Irish moss, surprising no one, is associated with the moon, the water element, and the signs Pisces and Cancer, and the deities Aphrodite, Luna, and Selene. Like, of course, something that comes from the sea is giving us, like, big lunar energy. Oh, you know, actually, can I please jump in? Yeah. Because I actually um, wanted to say, kind of tying my two sections together, though, that um, Astargetus is widely credited as the first time that femininity, emotion, water, and the moon were all sort of tied up together. Mm. Because Astargetus was also a moon goddess, um, and kind of becoming a mermaid was the first time that water was associated with both emotional times in your life, but also with the uh, with the feminine. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because there is this story of like an archaeologist who like held up this bone that had twenty eight slashes in it, and he was like, "This is man's first attempt at a calendar," and a woman was like actually that's most likely a woman's first attempt at a calendar because why would a man need to know about 28 day cycles right 
but menstrual cycles are 28 days menstrual yeah. cycles line up with the moon it's beautiful like yeah it re it really it really is but um i did forget to kind of throw that in with uh mermaids uh which i it was like a fun fact i was like oh i actually love that um so please go on please go yeah on. no i love that though i really do love that but the, the magical uses, though, for Irish moss tend towards luck and prosperity, which I was a little surprised by. I was like, there's so much prosperity magic here. But I guess algae does, you know, kind of take over places. You know, it does mm -hmm. tend to reproduce. But it is also, like, good for protection, which made a lot – that made a lot of logical sense to me because you can find it often on, like, rocky ledges well, in the I feel, ocean. I feel like that kind of vibe, too, like, how – for prosperity, I mean, where it's like you have something that's literally just growing out of rocks. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so for luck and prosperity, you can add a packet of like powdered Irish moss to your wallet or sprinkle a little in your shoe before you go gambling. I like to do like a drop of clove oil in my shoes when I need like protection and luck during the winter. But like doing just like a little sprinkle of something in your shoe is a really great way to like carry some magic with you oh yeah you can also of course though add it to incense blends so i was thinking if you wanted to do something for prosperity that also like balances lunar and solar energy you could do uh powdered irish moss rosemary and chamomile i think that would be a really nice blend plus the idea of like rosemary and chamomile i think might you know overpower any like smell i don't know what irish moss would smell like when you burned it i would imagine it's maybe not going to be my favorite scent in the world. So I also liked the idea of combining it with some like a couple of more strong smells. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also going to be a perfect addition to any prosperity candle spells. Powdered herbs are very easy to do the fried chicken roll in. And now for protection, you know, I'm going to recommend sprinkling some under your door, your doormat, right? Oh, doormat yeah. Dorm magic. Doormat magic. Take a drink. Right. Uh, I think it'll have like, it's it's a great like one two punch, right? Because it's not only protective, but it's also like welcoming prosperity into your home, which is like a win win. And I've also read a few recommendations online to add a packet to your luggage while you're traveling to like keep you safe, which I love. And so I came up with this like magical travel sachet, Nick, pay attention to throw into your luggage. And so I would include in it Irish moss, a cinnamon stick, some chamomile flowers and citrine and if you have it some like black tourmaline would also go perfectly here you know of course cleanse whatever you're using as your sachet with the smoke or incense that you use in your craft and then bless and like put your intention in each of the ingredients before adding it to the sachet and then close it up with a purple thread or string to kind of like honor your intuition on the journey because we all need to keep our wits about us when we're traveling and I think that'll serve as like a nice little protective amulet that's also drawing in some like prosperity and joy because we don't want to be so focused on like keeping all the negative away that we drive away all the energy. Hence, like the addition of things like citrine in there, which mm. I think is like po positive vibes. Got to bring, yeah. you got attract something positive. Yeah, it's not just about repelling the bad. You also want to attract the good. So um, I was also thinking like, for anyone who's going on a trip trying to like find some love you could maybe add some like rose petals or a little piece of rose quartz in there to like also attract some like love also, also i mean i mentioned it earlier but like good reasons to travel alone is because you can do that <laughs> yeah yeah so my sources today were ryandrum.com um he has this article called sea vegetables for food and medicine the herbarium's monograph wikipedia and an article that is titled, this is like the abstract I was talking about, marine sulfated polysaccharides as potential antiviral drug candidates to treat coronavirus disease. Um, <laughs> that's a lot. Midwestsupplies.com, welldivine.com, and breeandwalker.tumblr.com. Love it. Yeah. Also, I feel like, and this is just kind of like me just thinking out loud, but I feel feel like this would be such a good addition to like a vegan clam chowder oh god yeah because if it's got these like thickening pro properties and this oceany taste and uh, you know sort of famously like 
vegan cream does not thicken the same way that heavy cream does. Yeah. And carrageenan is in all sorts of vegan dairy products already. So it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, li I'm literally just over here. Like, I bet you could make kind of like a nice sort of like a vegan clam chowder. Well, you can order some Irish moss from Wild Terra online and try making a, a vegan clam chowder before it gets too hot. <laughs> well, be because I'm literally over here, like, I saw, we talk about her so much, but Black Forager, I, you know, was watching her TikTok recently and she is, it was oyster mushrooms and oh then, God, so and good. then some kind of seaweed to like make it taste oceany. And yeah, but speaking of, you know, we're, we're literally just at the bottom of the sea. Um, yeah. We're just hanging out here in the water. So for it's everyone nice. who's, who's like not on the Patreon and is, or, or is just listening to the audio in the background, like fully imagine that we are at the bottom of the ocean. Because we are. We're just, and I'm wearing my like we're, And we're going to stay, we're, we're going to stay there. I'm wearing my shiny velvet that feels very oceany to me. It's like very lunar. Oh yeah. Very lunar, very oceany. Um, I'm actually... Well, I'm wearing like a kind of like a big flannel shirt. I don't know if that's kind of sailory or not, but it's it's like 50 degrees here today. So I um, feel like it's like ocean side, like English cottage near the sea vibes. Yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of rainbow. I do love this shirt. Oh, it's a great shirt. Um, and it'd be great to like walk along an Irish beach and gather moss in because it's so nice and warm. Fuck yes. Um, but okay, so here I am. Uh, I know I'm getting to talk to all of you about amphitrite this week. Um, and actually, I'm saying amphitrite. It could be amphitrite. I mean, it would make sense with the Greek, but I think amphitrite sounds cooler. And I've heard it pronounced both ways. So if so you're, this is Nick's way. This is. I mean, if you're like a Greek historian. And you want to correct me, and like I'd love to have that conversation, but for now, fuck off, okay? So we're talking about amphitrite, and actually, in the process, I sort of get to answer one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves as witches, which is how do I become queen of the ocean? Every day I ask. Every day, every day we're asking ourselves this question, because truly that might be one of the most aspirational positions that you could possibly hope to achieve in life, right? So, oh, Hondo P. But for real, for real, um, considering how patriarchal and awful Greek society was structured at the time, the story actually does not go how you think it would. But some background first. So, Amphitrite is often considered herself to be a proxy goddess for an older pantheon, uh, namely Astargetus, who we've already talked about a little bit, uh, who is the patron goddess of northern Syria, goddess of the moon, goddess of culture, like really just involved in a lot of shit. But she got sad and she walked into the ocean and uh, instead of dying, became a mermaid and... I took over rulership of the sea as well. Very busy lady. Very, very busy lady. Um, but, you know, for those of you who know a little bit about geography, Greece is also near the ocean and contains a lot of islands. So it's really only natural that they would also feel this connection to like praising the bounty of the sea and sort of adopting this goddess from nearby. Um, and, but here's some fun etymology notes about amphitrite. So right off the bat, we have amphi, which is like amorphous, amphi, amphibian, um, and then trite, which is kind of like triton, uh, her son, who is a merman, who we already talked about just a little bit. Um, but also the Greek texts often refer to her at, and Poseidon as rulers of the third. And I did read this interesting thing where people were like, what does that even mean? Because it does, it, they never really say, they call them rulers of the third. And I'm speculating today about its meaning because to me, I'm like, it's sort of a no brainer because like the third is, is, is like land, air and sea. It, I mean, 
if the sea is the if they're the rulers of the sea, if the sea is the third thing, what are the first two? Well, obviously land and air, land, air, and sea. Um makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. It's not important, but that you know, it's part of her title. It is part of her title, yeah. you know, like you know, sort of <laughs> amphitrite, uh, queen of the ocean, ruler of the third, you know, like whatever. Um but here's the deal. And honestly, I think the real surprise here. So I had thought that Amphitrite became queen of the ocean by virtue of marrying Poseidon. And oh boy, was I wrong. So before there were even stories about Poseidon, there was this kind of residual worship of Astargetus, Amph Amphitrite. Um, and she's the foremost of the Nereids. So you guys will, of course, remember from the episode about Vulcan, who was raised by a Nereid, who was not Amphitrite. Uh, the Nereids are these primordial ocean nymphs, and they're spawned by the titan Oceanus and um, his partner. And therefore, they're the original rulers of the sea, and they represent, like, the primal forces of the sea, even, because they're these, like, na elemental nature spirits. Um, and Amphitrite is already, like, she's the head bitch in charge of the Nereids. Yeah. And I think something important to think about here is that the, the Olympic gods, the Olympian gods, so, like, Zeus, Poseidon, Hera, the, the original set, um, it's not like they have, like, specific powers that are associated with their domains. It's almost like they kind of pick and choose what their domains are. Um, so they all kind of have like a general set of powers uh, and then they kind of picked specialties even. Um, which is important because it's like Poseidon was not like born to be the god of the sea. Yeah. He kind of picked even, you know, so it's like Zeus picked being the god of the sky and, and thunder and, and Poseidon who is in many ways, just as powerful as Zeus and is kind of represented as being like this sort of an alternate god, you know, it's like Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades um, kind of on more of an equal playing field than other gods. So Poseidon is a very powerful god, but, but he chose the sea. He chose the sea. And um, so, yeah. Amphitrite already is in charge of the sea, even though she's not married to Poseidon yet. So what we have, and I think a good metaphor for this, is what happened with Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip. So she was gonna be the queen of the ocean regardless. And he, actu he actually, Poseidon, married into that. Yeah. And not the other way around. So it's very much like girl power. Um, and if you and if you can't people see, of yeah. the world. And it yeah, and if you didn't see, I did the little peace signs like the Spice Girls, you know, like girl power. Um so, but yeah, we have like a Queen Elizabeth II situation, and it's a cool role reversal from how a lot of the Greek mythology usually goes, where it's like Zeus just being awful and some poor woman getting involved. Yeah. Um, Can I just, like, interject here to ask you what you think about this, like, conspiracy that the queen is dead? Oh, I kind of buy it. I mean, I her, hus too. her husband did just die, and sort of famously, when that happens, a lot of time old people will just die, like, if their partner dies. And yeah. they've been together for, like, 70 years or some crazy shit like that. And it that. has been quite a while since anyone has seen her IRL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I did see, or I saw this picture recently where it was like, it didn't even look like her at something, like yeah. from a weird angle and far away. And the caption actually was, yep, she's definitely still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I just like. No, no, no. But, but really though, really though. Um, yes, I have seen it. But yeah, so Poseidon married into the royal family of the ocean and not the other way around um so let's get into that though 
what was their dating life like? And like any classic teen American drama, it all started at a dance. Though, to be clear, it was not one of those awful school dances where you leave room for Jesus and you could literally pass out from the smell of Vax body spray. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just like a, it was sort of a public dance involving all of the Nereids and it was on the island of Naxos. And so I just want everyone to just sort of imagine now. 50 or, you know, sometimes this in the story, there's 50 Nereids and sometimes there's a hundred, you know, I really don't know why so different, but it's either 50 or a hundred and it's all of the original sea nymphs and they're performing like a choreographed dance. And I don't know why I'm like imagining it like a luau. Maybe it's cause it's like, it's on an island. Um, but back to the main story though. I'll, actually, you know what though? Like all of the sea nymphs dancing at once, like, just knowing that sea nymphs can call up storms. Can you imagine like what must have been going on if all of the sea nymphs are like doing a choreographed dance? Oh my God. I'm, yeah. I, I'm literally just imagining like that's how they invented hurricanes. Probably. Uh, but so they're all having this dance, which I imagine to be sort of like a hula because it's like on Naxos, which is a volcanic island as well. Um, and I really don't know why, but that's literally what I'm imagining. So, um, and there, but Poseidon sees it, right? And Poseidon, again, sort of has these designs to take over the ocean. Um, because, you know, Zeus takes over the, the sky and Mount Olympus and Hades is in charge of the underworld. And, and he's like, well, I need something. So he's going to take over the ocean and he's sort of power hungry at this point. Um, but he sees Amphitrite, he sees her dancing, and it must have been a really good dance because he made it his absolute golden life to make the gorgeous sea woman his wife. And so this is actually where it does depart a little bit from other Greek myths as well, because there's not trickery involved and there's not a rapey scenario. So like reverse trigger warning, reverse trigger warning even. Uh, I would say empowerment. Uh, and I'm going to say it again, girl power, you know, people of the world, spice up spice your life. Spice up your life. Um, so at first, Amphitrite is not exactly keen to play along with Poseidon's like power play, like his political maneuvering. And she travels across the seas to the Atlas Mountains, which are on the edge of the world. <laughs> if you didn't know. And she wants to have a little fucking peace and quiet, okay? And Poseidon, it should be noted again that he is not king of the ocean yet, since all kinds of animal emissaries all over the four corners of the world uh, to make a case for him and his uh, love, because he does feel romantic love towards Amphitrite, you know? Like, yes, he wants to take over the ocean, and it would be very convenient to marry into the royal family of the ocean as a way to seize power. But he's also, he's, he loved, he saw her dance and he's- And she looked fine. And he is the most smitten of kittens. Um, yeah. Luck would have it though, that it was a sea creature who eventually finds Amphitrite though. And it's none other than Delphinus, the king of the dolphins. Which, I mean, that sounds like a, a, a Narnian sort of character. Yeah. Also, it's just hard for me to, like, not think poorly of dolphins knowing how rapey they are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, like, I'm disappointed in you. The dolphin pillow I slept on for most of my girlhood is tainted. It's tainted. The memory is tainted, even. Yeah. Um... So, but it's Delphinus, the king of the dolphins, finds Amphitrite in the Atlas Mountains. Uh, I guess she was by the coast. She is a sea nymph after all, but yeah. somehow she's in the mountains and on the coast at the same time. It happens, so. Like you do. Um, I mean, I haven't been to the edge of the world. I hear it's lovely this time of year. Yeah. But she's, so Delphinus finds him and... 
he very rationally explains that this Poseidon guy does have these designs of taking over the ocean and marrying him, agreeing to marry him, might be the only way to keep the sea in harmony. Because of his romantic attachment to her, she actually has that power over him and she can sort of be this calming influence and sort of keep him in check. And she's really the only one in a position to keep him in check. So if she doesn't do it, like the sea could be thrown into chaos and the the rest of the world even could be thrown into chaos. Yeah, I also just like love the diplomacy here. Right. So she agrees. And it might not be the most romantic proposal, but ultimately for Greek gods, this is enthusiastic consent. This is the and, most enthusiastic consent we've talked about in a long time. And I, I think it's a sign of Amphitrite, Amphitrite's power even that a case had to be made to her. And ultimately everyone was going to respect her decision, including Poseidon. Like he was going to have to find a different way to become king of the ocean. Um, so the wedding happens and eventually Delphinus, who did put all of this into motion, passes away of old age, and Amphitrite and Poseidon agree to immortalize him forever as a constellation. So um, our condolences to the dolphin community, but that is a pretty nice funeral gift. Agreed. And as it goes, the happy couple eventually have children, the most famous of which is, of course, Triton, who is a bona fide merman. Um, but Poseidon, like the other Olympian gods, does get over the honeymoon phase pretty quickly and gets into the usual dalliances with other nymphs and mortals and goddesses and even some sea creatures. It's, it's not pretty, you know. Poseidon would fuck a mermaid. Uh, yeah. Poseidon is, the, Poseidon is exactly the kind of creep that would fuck a mermaid. Um, I'm glad you're not going to be traveling on the ocean anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, um, yeah, but so Amphitrite herself doesn't just have Poseidon's mer spawn. She also does give birth to some of the great sea monsters of Greek mythology uh, and all manner of new sea creatures as well. So like seals and things are famously birthed by amphitrite and come into the world and um you know start their own breeding population i like to believe that the loch ness monster is descended from like sea ness monsters oh yeah oh uh, from yeah. amphitrite it's just crawling out you know like she's just giving birth all the she's like a guppy you know just... <laughs> i love it um because you, you know guppies are like always fucking pregnant yeah and then the, and then they eat their babies um which I mean, is they're making their own snacks they're making their own upcycling delicious. baby yeah 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 <laughs> well it takes a lot of energy to continuously be having babies yeah. and sometimes you gotta you gotta take some of that energy back don't you so but okay and actually i i could stop here and leave amphitrite as a surprisingly feminist figure from greek mythology and truly one of the great regents of the sea there is actually one story that i think shows her jealousy and rage-filled side i mean the sea has a lot of storms okay yeah, like the, the sea, sea is, snaps boats in half the sea snaps boats in half it's not all calm seas all the time um and yes we do respect her balancing influence on Poseidon's ambitious craziness, uh, but she's got her own stuff going on. And this is Wants and Fronts. This is hard-hitting investigative journalism. So we want to yeah. tell the whole The story. whole truth. The whole story. Which means we have to talk about Skyla, who was this gorgeous younger sea nymph who had caught Poseidon's eye and uh, basically was Poseidon's mistress. And 
I mean, we've all had bad days where we just kind of snap. So like, let's give Amphitrite the appropriate breathing room here. She is the queen of the ocean after all. Getting fucked around on constantly. Getting fucked around on constantly, which I think would piss anyone off. Yeah. Uh, But basically she's sick of her cheating ass husband. And she really wants to make a show of her power because we do have to remember she was going to be queen of the ocean regardless of if she married Poseidon or not. And she kind of is like, I just want to show like who married into whose oceanic royal family. It's a power play. Okay. And poor Skyla is caught in the crossfire. Yeah. And so basically Amphitrite, who is also showing off a surprising adeptness for herbal magic, and maybe she's using seaweed in her little potion kit, because a sea witch, am I right? Yeah. Uh, she, she creates a blend of herbs, though, that when she throws it into Skyla's bath, turns her into a grotesque sea monster with 12 arms and six mouths. So basically just a ball of arms and mouths. Um, and that is a as, funky ball of tits from the bottom of the ocean. A funky ball of tits from the bottom of the ocean. But so, and as a sea monster is wont to do, Skyla moves into a sea cave underwater and uses her like tentacles to pull unsuspecting sailors to the bottom of the sea and feast on their bones. Um. So the moral of the story here is don't cross the queen of the ocean. Mm -mm. And to answer the question of how one becomes queen of the ocean, you actually just have to be born into it. Uh, Becoming king of the ocean, however, you can do by political maneuvering, uh, diplomacy, and uh, a talking dolphin. Yeah, I... uh... I, I love that it's like, yeah, you just have to be born into it. Like that article that I recently saw the headline for that was like, millennials, you want to buy a home? You might have to wait for an inheritance. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Um... Just wait for your parents to die. But can we back up for a second and just think about the physics of taking a bath under the water? Oh, I, and I, I love that too. It's like Vulcan building a blacksmith's forge under the sea. It's very SpongeBob. Yeah. Like I love sponge, it. Like SpongeBob drinking a glass of water underwater yeah i'm like i have so many questions i i have a lot of well, spongebob taking a bath even yeah but they don't need answers it's fine it's so, fine <laughs> today very appropriately i have a message for scorpio look at this cat bah, 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 bah. and so for those of you who are not on the patreon watching there is a adorable white kitty swatting at a scorpion yeah very cute and for you i have drawn the ace of wands which the wands are represented by birch in the blooming cat tarot which i love little castle in the back and water the sea so that's the that's the queen of the ocean's house yeah so uh this is such an ostara card though right because like the ace of wands is all about opportunities inspiration it's like this idea that the universe is conspiring in your favor right so there's like a flow of new ideas and some creativity that's surrounding you at this moment and like follow your gut if something feels right go for it you know you can always like take a few small steps down a path and if it feels right great and if it doesn't like fucking bail out try something else this is kind of like a green light card right like if you've been thinking of taking up a new hobby starting a new book learning a new language now's the time but just remember that like all the aces the ace of wands is an opportunity not a promise so the aces are the seed but you have to actually like plant it and tend to it yourself so like let the fire of airy season help you on your path to whatever new creative journey you're going on and maybe like crawl into some water maybe take a meditative bath journal about it do some tarot which seems like something a scorpio would do though Totally, totally. But yeah, so that's all she wrote for you, my dear Scorpions. So you guys, hi. Hi, hello. It's the, it, it's the end. And I think to all of you wet bitches, 
to I say, all of the wet bitches. If you say blessed be, you soaking wet bitches. <laughs> blessed be, you soaking wet bitches. Goodbye. Bye now. Oh my God, that one got me. <laughs>